Well, welcome everybody to Studio B. I am your host, Pastor MDH. Thank you for joining us again uh, for another episode here on the set of Studio B. Uh, make sure that wherever you're following us from, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, IG, that you like, follow, comment, subscribe, uh, so that you don't miss anything that's going on here on the set of Studio B. And just remember that wherever you access your podcast from, whatever platform that may be, Spotify, Apple, Google, wherever it may be, You can also find Studio B on that particular platform as well. So now we are literally everywhere. And I want to just take a little bit of a time just to thank those who have um, commented, those who have shared, those who have liked, those who tune in every single week. Man, we greatly, greatly appreciate you. We just uh, passed over 2,000 subscribers on YouTube. Thank you for that. Um, that is a blessing. And man, I believe that this year is going to be a great year for us. We're going to be talking about some things that uh, some would consider to be controversial, but we will never uh, shy away from those topics here on the set of Studio B. So thank you again for all of those who, who support um, this particular podcast. We do not take that for granted. Uh, here we are again in 2021, just a few weeks in. And and I want to talk about something today that I've talked about maybe about four or five times on the podcast before. Um, and it's a particularly hot button issue, uh, as it has always been uh, through the decades. It's always been a hot button, uh, it, a hot button issue. Uh, but I want to talk about um, this whole thing about racial equality. Uh, everybody, I don't know if you know this, but I am a black man. I am an African-American. I am a Negro. I am you know, whatever description you want to put on the birth certificate, I am he. I'm 47 years old, and I've been a black man all of my life. Um, I've grown up around black people. My family is black. I have a a very well working knowledge of what it means to be black and be black in America and go throughout some of the issues and the ills that have plagued America over its years. Um, But one of the things that I have said and continue to propagate is that um, the African-American race, the black race, is a very, very unique race. It is um, a group and a set of people that have, through the years, overcome tremendous challenges, Um, tremendous challenges to the degree that not only have they come through them, but that they have prospered beyond them. So what was meant to kill and to destroy and to maim has actually made us, for the most part, very, very stronger. We've come through them not just scathing through those particular issues, but have come out better on the other side of those issues. And and it's not that black America or African Americans are superior to any race because I do not believe in race superiority. Um, That's just a lie from the pit of hell. Um, Everybody bleeds red. Um, But there is a uniqueness in the African American race um, that is found within its roots. African Americans, um, now let me just kind of take us back just a little bit. Um, we all are familiar with the transatlantic uh, slave trade. Um, we all know that we ha- that they brought those eight Africans over here in 1619 in Plymouth Rock. Uh, we get that, but the actual slave trade started way before 1619. And one of the things that's very, very interesting about the slave trade is that America did not even perfect the slave trade. Um, America was actually a newbie, a baby, in regards to its slave practices. We were not very good at it. When you're talking about people that were good at the slave trade, you're looking at Great Britain, you're looking at Spain, you're looking at Portugal, and you're even looking at Brazil. Um, When you're looking at the transatlantic slave trade, only 23% of those slaves were bought to the Americas. Uh, 40% of those slaves that were taken from Africa uh, were dropped off in Brazil and Portugal and Spain and all along the coastline areas. So when you're looking at slavery in America, America did not in any way, shape or form perfect slavery, not in any way, shape or form. Uh, Great Britain, our great oppressor before then, um, were one that actually perfected the um, um, evil practices of slavery. 
But in 1619 is when the whole slavery thing came into being. Um, it became a very profitable industry in regards to sugarcane fields and cotton fields. And cheap to no labor was these African-Americans who could not read, but were very strong and viral people that could work very long, extensive periods of time and therefore produce a greater harvest and a greater profit um, for their masters or plantation owners. And so throughout the channels of history, now we have uh, African-American slaves by the millions um, in, in America doing slave work, picking cotton and things of that nature, generally held on plantations, larger plantations um, for slave labor. And as we go through all of this, now this is mainly concentrated in the South, but not limited to the South. Um, that's a myth that slavery was just concentrated or mainly uh, practiced in the South. It was actually practiced in the North too, just not as prevalent as it was in the South. But America has a rich history in that regard, and that's a stain that I believe that America is continually having to relive, even as it states in 2021. That was a horrible stain on America's history, and it is one that America still pays for even to this day. But as you look at slavery and look at how the African Americans and black folks came through um, the, the evil practices of slavery and oppression um, all through no fault of their own, just being born a particular color and being born in a particular group, uh, they were subjugated to uh, evil practices that had nothing to do with them personally. But through a whole series of events, and I believe, now please hear what I'm saying here, African-Americans, uh, the black culture has always, since its inception, um, been very conservative in its belief, uh, been very, very God-centered and very family-centered. Um, even in the midst and even in the, the middle of slavery, African-Americans were very enriched in conservative practices like family and God and, and community. Um, they were very, very intrigued in those particular beliefs. And I believe it was that particular belief that caused them to stay together and even prosper through those evil practices um, the way that they did. And so we owe a rich, rich, rich thank you to our forefathers, great grandmothers, great grandfathers who endured things that were too horrible to even think about and speak of right now, but they endured them with courage and with um, with, with with vigor and came out on the other side of that to tell their stories. And so when you're looking at the African-American race, the African-American race is a very, very rich, rich, rich race that has a lot to offer, not only to society at large, but even in within our own society. We are a very, very rich and traditional um, uh, culture. And I say all that to say this, when, when, when you're talking about African-American and the race issue that we are facing here in 2021, and even not just in 2021, but from decades past, I mean, um, I am of the staunch opinion that I have said many times before on this podcast and to many friends and associates that while we still have issues in America in regards to race, uh, 2021 is nothing like 1950. Uh, we have come a long way in regards to race relations here. Here in America. Now, we still got a long way to go, but we have made tremendous strides in trying to bridge some of those chasms that exist between racial uh, lines. America right now is as diverse as it has ever been. Um, a quick study through Google will tell you that in the United States alone, there are 136 African-American mayors, and that's either through large metropolitan areas like we have here in the city of Houston. That is the fourth largest city on its way to being the third largest city in America. Uh, we have an African-American mayor here in the city of Houston that just got elected to his second term. Uh, before him, uh, we had an LGBT mayor, uh, mayor by the name of Anise Parker. Um, you have right now in America 136 African-American mayors, uh, whether through big cities or small towns, that infiltrate or make up um, the dynamics of America. When you're looking at the 157th Congress that is in session right now, it is the most culturally diverse Congress that has ever been. And I'm not just talking about from an African-American standpoint. I'm talking about from a religious standpoint of Muslims and Sheikhs. I'm also even talking
talking about from a standpoint of having more women in Congress than there have ever been throughout the history of Congress. Uh, we are living right now in a world that is culturally diverse, um, and that's from the north all the way to the south and all in between. Uh, America is as culturally diverse as it has ever been, ever been. And one of the things about, and I had this conversation that uh, with, a, with a good friend of mine that said that the system allows for certain successes. Well, when you're talking about the system at large, and this is one of the, com this is the conversation that I want to get into, the system itself, ha if the system does work, if the system is still the system, then the system protects itself against anything that would be a threat to that system. Uh, let me take you back to the slave days when uh, a slave would try to um, um, escape from the plantation and they would have slave bounty hunters that would go out and track these slaves down. And once they would, uh, um, once they would capture these escaped slaves, the master of that plantation could have easily taken that slave into the private quarters, whether that's the barn or into the house, and reprimanded that slave in private to make sure that that slave never tried to escape again. But that's not what they did. The master would often take that runaway slave that he just caught and bring them back and then gather all the other slaves on the plantation and publicly humiliate and punish that slave for trying to escape. And he would do so publicly in front of all the other slaves as to send a message to everybody else. If you're thinking about escaping, this is what will happen to you because the system then was protecting itself against anybody that would dare try to escape. It. And so there were public lessons that were being given to those in that particular system to make sure that they would squash any idea of somebody trying to get out of that system. Because the system, in order for the system to work, the system had to protect itself. And that's greatly what they did uh, all through the slave um, um, days. Even in 1863, when our ninth president, Abraham Lincoln, tried to or did um, propose the Emancipation Proclamation, which would free millions of slaves along the South, um, it was met with fierce opposition because the system was trying to protect itself. Now, be, be not dismayed. The slave trade was vigorous fought because of money um, because now you're getting ready to um, emancipate millions of slaves and take them off of slaves plantations where they are picking cotton which is very profitable um, for their masters and picking sugarcane out of the sugarcane fields which is very profitable for their masters and so when you emancipate millions of slaves all at once then you mess up people's money and so that's where we get the great civil war, the, the South and the North, um, um, the Confederates against the Union. That's where the whole civil war was fought because you're getting ready to emancipate all of these black people. And by doing so, you're going to mess up a lot of people's money. Well, that was the system trying to protect itself because the system felt a threat against itself. And so through uh, God's providence, and I do believe that God had his hand through that, uh, the Civil War was one of the most bloodiest wars in American history. Uh, millions of people, uh, thousands of people, thousands upon thousands, hundreds of thousands of people uh, lost their lives in that bloody uh, Civil War battle. But on the outskirts of that, we get the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863 um, by Abraham Lincoln that literally freed millions of slaves uh, in the deep south and all along the border routes. And so now you have uh, millions of black folks that have been enslaved, most of them for the, for the majority of their lives. Most of them had had babies and, and children that were born into slavery. Most of them did not have the capacity to read and write. And so now you have... Um, uh, now you have these millions of slaves that are freed, but they have no tangible skills by which to offer to society. And then you have these things called vagrancy laws that were implemented. So the system was trying to protect itself against itself because it did not want to be infiltrated. Now, with the uh, 13th Amendment, and that's where we get the Emancipation Proclamation, the 13th Amendment, there is a back clause to the 13th Amendment that says that there should be no involuntary servitude except for those who break the law. So literally, not just figuratively, but literally, uh, the prison system of today is an extension 
of the of the cotton fields and the sugarcane fields of the 1800s because it is an extension of involuntary servitude. That's what it is. That there should be no involuntary servitude, nobody forced to work against their will except for the breaking of a law which leads to the conviction of that particular person and then sent to prison for prison labor or uh, chain gangs. That's exactly what the prison labor system is today. And so there are things in which America is still haunted with even to this day. But there is something, everybody, that I would say, um, as I have had this conversation across many lines with theologians, pastors, uh, educators, friends from all different walks of life, from Democrat to Republican to Independent to uh, my, my brothers who are into, you know, black power and, and, and the black man needs to separate and do his own thing. I've had this conversation across many lines. And so I, th th this is nothing that is new, what I'm bringing up to you today. But I believe that where we are right now in regards to race equality uh, in the United States of America, please hear what I'm saying. We still have work to do, but we are nowhere near where we once were. And I can state uh, a million and one facts that I have here for to you today, uh, because here's what I want to do with this particular conversation is drive the conversation to a point of productivity. And there is a buzzword. Um, um, there is a buzzword that creates um, uh, the angst amongst African-Americans. And I can say this word and people can say this word. We're not even without any hard facts to the case or to the actual argument itself. But when they say the word racism, the word racism brings up within the black person, even if you're born outside of the slave era, even if you have absolutely no affiliation to anything of those practices, it brings up within the black man because of the history here in the United States, a very, very uneasy feeling. It's a buzzword. Uh, racism, racism, racism. But racism is a disease of the heart. Um, racism is a disease of the heart. Racism comes from an evil place in the heart where somebody believes that just because of their race, they are better than somebody else. That's racism or any ism for that matter. Classism. Uh, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, a person believes that they are better than someone else because of something that they have that that other person does not have. Now, race relations is no uh, stranger to America, but it's no stranger to the world. Uh, world War One and World War Two were from racism. Uh, uh, Hitler, uh, the Aryan nation, said that my race is superior in his particular case to the Jews. Uh, to anybody not of Aryan descent, you are far less superior than we are. And because we are of Aryan blood, we are better than everybody else. So racism is not exclusive to uh, the Americas. It's not exclusive to the United States, to America. This is a world issue. And therefore, because it's not exclusive to one particular area, Area, that's how you know it's an issue of the heart. It's an issue that plagues and that darkens the soul of man's conscience. It is not just an American thing. It is a world thing. Uh, I've been to Africa now nine times. Um, Africa, you know, of the, all the countries in Africa, only two countries in Africa have never been colonized. That's Ethiopia and Libya. But all the other countries in Africa have been colonized by the Portugal, by the Portuguese, by the Spain, um, by the British. And so there you have, even on the country and even on the continent of Africa, you have predominantly 75, 80 percent of black people that will overtake taken by those coming from outside of their continent to impose upon them a superior belief. So racism is not just exclusive to America. It's a world thing. It's a heart thing. And so when we understand that, we understand that we have to fight racism differently. You have to fight racism, not by policy, not by restriction. Uh, you got to fight racism where it lives. And that's in the heart of men. Uh, racism is very easily debunked, but you got to fight it from not a policy perspective, even though policy can help. Um, we can't fight it in that regard because it's a heart issue. And so when I talk about racism in the black community right now, I have since said and will continue to say 
um, that black America is stronger than what most people give us credit for. Uh, everybody is always trying to help black America. Like, we need the help. We got to have the help. And, and you poor, um, um, disenfranchised, um, always the man's foot up on your neck, always oppressed, always held back, um, always got this going on in your life. You need our help. And the problem with that, with that statement is that it's absolutely false. Uh, black America, uh, the African-American race is a strong and resilient race. And, and we, ha we have proven over the, over the countless centuries that we can handle hard things coming our way. And so what does that look like for 2021? Uh, everybody, we just elected um, for the first time, not just a African-American, but we elected an African-American with Indian descent. And I'm not talking about Indian in regards to Navajo or Cherokee. I'm talking about from the continent of India. Um, uh, the, the, she is of Indian descent. But she's not only an African-American, she is a woman. And so watch this. America now just elected a African-American woman to the vice presidency role, Kamala Harris, uh, to the vice presidency role in um, to the United States president, to the executive branch. Now, watch this. You got Joe Biden as the president. You have Vice President, Madam, uh, Madam Vice President Harris, and then you have Speaker Pelosi. So you have uh, uh, President Biden as the, the, the commander in chief, and then the person right behind him is Vice President Harris, and then the third person in line is Speaker Pelosi. So you have two women in line to be the president of the United States of America. I say this to you because, again, America is as culturally diverse as it has ever been. And so the idea that America is as racist as it's ever been, as sexist as it's ever been, as homophobic as it has ever been, as xenophobic as it has ever been, is absolutely ridiculous. The numbers just simply don't bear that out. But how do we get to a point of attacking this from a very, very real way? Uh, I know many people in my life right now that are highly successful. Uh, highly successful in whatever career or endeavor that that God has allowed them to participate in. Um, I believe that the greatest um, mark for success is your ability to work at whatever you are good at and whatever type of work ethic that you are willing to put in to being successful in whatever endeavor that you may be in. I, I know too many uh, successful people of color, minorities that have worked hour after hour, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year in order to achieve a dream that they uh, felt like they were chasing. And I have many examples thereof. So when we're talking about America right now and what does it present to the minority, what does it present to the black man, to the black woman, to the uh, to, to the Hispanic, to to whatever race that there may be. America is by far, by far the best place to achieve whatever dreams you want to accomplish. And America does not put limits on that particular dream. Now, will there be problems? Will there be adversities that we all have to go through in order to achieve those particular dreams? I highlighted last week um, a very, and I don't say this because it's vogue, because that's just what we do, but I draw from the well of Martin Luther King um, and the wisdom by which God placed in that man often in my life. Um, if I if I could have had the opportunity to meet um, any particular people, and I got a list of five people that I would love to admit, um, if, if they were still alive today and Martin Luther King would be number three on my list of five. I think that what God did in this man's life and what he was able to accomplish, not just in the spiritual way, but in the social uh, reform and bringing the Voting Rights Act, um, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and God using a Baptist minister to usher into that social change uh, for me is just as a pastor and one that is committed to social uh, justice. It, it is something that is greatly empowering to me when I look at the work of Dr. Martin Luther King and all that he went through in order to bring about those particular changes to America. But I highlighted him last week because I wanted us to understand what he did in his 
um, in his quest to make sure that all men were equal. He he often quoted, as I said last week, Galatians chapter number three, verse 28, where there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor free male, nor slave nor free, but we are all one in Christ Jesus. He also uh, quoted Matthew chapter number 20, uh, Matthew chapter number 12, verse number 25 through 28, that if a house is divided against itself, it shall not stand. And so he, he stood on these two pillars in regards to American policy by saying black against white, rich against poor, educated against non-educated, would eventually bring America, as great as it was, to its knees. And so in that same vein, I draw from that wisdom because I believe that that was a powerful man. Not that he was a man that was without fault, um, because if you are a student of history, of course he was not without fault, as none of us are, but he was a man that was greatly used by God and used by God to cross not only the spiritual lines, but even into the political um, arena. And so through the work of Dr. Martin Luther King over um, the, the, from 1957 to 1968, uh, in the most pivotal years of his life, to, to where he spoke over 2,700 times in all different regards and, and spoke in the Senate chambers, sat down in the Oval Offices of John F. Kennedy and Lyndon B. Johnson, uh, this was a man that God used to usher in change that we all now benefit from in 2021. So I richly draw from that well of wisdom by uh, the works of Dr. Martin Luther King. But Dr. Martin Luther King was one of those who proposed that while the system has angst, while the system has some issues, while the system is still trying to protect itself in certain ways, what he also propagated was the value of the home and the value of a stable home in regards to the black community and being able to overcome some of those challenges that uh, African Americans were facing in that particular day. And so when you're looking at where we are right now in 2021, crossed over into a brand new year, a brand new administration, uh, brand new senators, brand new congressmen, all these different walks of life. We got all these uh, new things that are on the horizon. The question now begs is what now? How do we bridge the gap? Um, I don't want to sound like a pessimist because I'm not a pessimist, uh, but I do believe that there are some issues that we are fighting tooth and nail over that can only be fixed by God's grace. I believe that policy works, that we can put policy in place, that we can do certain things, but the things in which are going to make the lasting change in the hearts of people can only be done by the hand of God. And one of those things is, is racism. Uh, we have to racism, and please hear this, everybody. Racism is a taught behavior. Uh, no child comes out of the womb of their mother hating another person simply because of the color of their skin, simply because of their ethnicity, simply because of their religion, simply because of their walk of life. Um, isms, whatever ism that may be, um, is a taught and a learned behavior. Um, and so those things are taught generally inside of the home with the people that have the most influence over their children and that is their parents, that is their social structure. And so what we're beginning to, if we're going to combat this in a very, very positive way, if we're going to make inroads that are going to last, that are going to make um, changes in our lives that we're going to be able to see even in our grandkids' lives, even in their kids' lives, then this stuff has got to start in the home. You cannot legislate the home to policies that come out of whatever that may be, whether that's on um, uh, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, whether that's in the state house, whether that's in the city hall, whatever municipality that you may be thinking of, that's not where that policy starts. The policy actually starts inside of the home. And so as a one that researches and, though, and one that is a, a lover of history, which I am, um, I believe that Ecclesiastes chapter number three is correct, that there is nothing new that it's under the sun. What has happened has already happened. If you want to see what's going to happen in the future, then simply look at what's happened in the past and being able to right the ship because of the mistakes that have been made. And you can change some things of how it will look in the future. Well, one of the things that we have to look at is this thing about the home. Um, the home is very, very important. And again, I bring this and converge this to what this looks like in regards to the African-American. Now, I'm going to tell you some numbers here that are not just exclusive to African-Americans, but actually go over to the Caucasians and white America as well. And not just white America, but Hispanic America and any minority race, uh, because these numbers are absolutely important. When you're looking at 1965, the rate of 
of motherlessness, or excuse me, um, um, out of wedlock births in 1965 was at the tender rate of 23.6%. That's a general rule. Is uh, It was as high as 25%, depending on what studies that you look at. I'm happy to take mine from the Brookings Review. And so in 1965, you're looking at right around about 24% of births in the African-American community were to out-of-wedlock parenting, meaning that it were born, that baby, that son, that daughter, was born into a single-parent home, typically uh, a single mother. It was around about 24% in 1965. Um, that was a high number in that day and a very dramatic number by which preachers in that day um, focused a lot of their attention on that particular number because that was a high number in 1965 in the African-American community that 24% of all new births were to single mother homes. And so pastors and, and community leaders were focusing a lot of attention and a lot of community programming around the African-American community to bring down that 24% number down to a much more manageable number because they said 24%, 24 out of every 100 births in the African-American community in 1965 were born to single mother homes. And that was a big deal in 1965. Well, you take that number in 1965 and you take that across to um, um, the Caucasian race, the white race, and that number was at 6.4% in 1965. So you got 24 point, uh, 24% in the African-American community. You got 6% in the white community. And these numbers were extremely high in both communities in 1965. So both communities looked at that perspective number and said that's too high for that number to be in my community, African-Americans and the white community. So you take that number in 1965 of 24% in the African-American uh, African community and take that all the way up to 2018, which is our most recent numbers, and you take 24% in 1965 to a whopping 71.6% in 2018. So in 2018, in 2018, the number nearly tripled in almost what, 50 years, 45, 50 years. So it goes from, in, in 1965, 24% of all new births in the African-American community were born to single mother parents, single mother parents in 1964, 1965. You take that to almost the mid-70% range in 2018. So think about this, think about this. Almost 70, 75% in 2018, of all new births in the African-American community were born to single mother parents. That means no father in the home. That means no father in the home. Three times as much as it was in 1965. And when you look at the statistics in regards to poverty and crime rates of those 24% uh, that were born into out-of-wedlock homes in 1964, and you look at the education, the poverty rates, and you look at the crime rates of those particular people in 1964, the numbers match uh, the rate of, of out-of-wedlock motherhood. And so what does that mean? That means that there's a direct line to poverty rates. There's a direct line to crime rates. There's a direct line to educational rates of those who are born into out-of-wedlock homes. Now, there's a myriad of different factors that has to go into this particular conundrum. However, one of the primary roles to that is this, this, this epidemic that we are facing right now in 2021, now in 2021, not just in this particular year, but years leading up to that, is this epidemic of, of, of um, single parent households. Um, there's a quote by Denzel Washington um, when he had did um, uh, a movie, um, I think it's called Esquire, uh, where he was a lawyer, um, and he was asked about um, the system. And here's what Denzel Washington said. He said, it starts at home. It starts with how you raise your children. If a young man does not have a father figure, he will go out into the world to find a father figure. Denzel said, according to this source, you know that you can't blame the system entirely, but it's unfortunate that we make it much easier for the system to work when we produce kids in out-of-wedlock homes. Now, again, 
if you are a purveyor of history, if you know if you know this stuff, and, and you go back to what it looks like um, in 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 real time data, it's not the only cause. It's not the only cause, but it is a great cause. And I want you to hear this from a biblical standpoint. The first thing that God created of any substance that would recreate his glory was the family unit. That's in Genesis chapter one, verse number 26. He created man and female in his own image and in his own likeness. Uh, The first thing that God did was create family. And he created family to duplicate his likeness to duplicate his likeness. That's the only way that the likeness of God and the image of God would be duplicated is through the rearing of children in the family unit. That's how God ordained it. And so in Genesis chapter number two, verse number 18, he says, it is not good for man to be alone. I'll make him a helper comparable to himself. Why is it not good for man to be alone? Because man alone by himself cannot reproduce my image and my likeness. So I have to give him somebody that can help him reproduce my glory, which is my image and my likeness. So God brought Adam Eve. Okay. And that was the first unit First family unit on the earth. We see in Genesis chapter number four that Adam knew his wife and they brought forth Cain and Abel. So here it is, Adam and Eve, the first married couple, the first husband and wife, the first mother and father of the earth came together and brought forth and brought forth children. They were bringing forth children in order to duplicate the glory of God through his image and through his likeness. So the first thing that God did was create family. He created family 4,000 years before he instituted the church. And so family is very, 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 very important. And so when we get away from the family unit and then we as parents delegate our responsibility to the teachers and delegate our responsibility to lawmakers and delegate our responsibility to social influences, we do a disservice to our children. We are the greatest influences in our children's lives, bar none. I don't care what you tell me about social media and I don't care what you tell me about movies and all of the stuff that our kids have to incorporate in this day. I get all of that. Yes, it does influence them. But the greatest influence to our children are the parents to those children. Children are like wet cement. Whatever falls on them makes an impression. And so what they see in the home, which is their greatest learning experience, which is the which which is the the incubator to how they will view the world, which will shield them, which will protect them, which will give them or shape to them a worldview, which is what they will leave the house with and incorporate and live into this world is what they learn at the house. And that's why Paul talks about in first Timothy that if anybody desires the house or desires the office of a bishop or desires the office of leading anybody, you first got to lead your own house well. And so the home matters. The home absolutely matters. And so to relegate the house as not being relevant in a conversation talking about what's going on and the stuff that we are producing in this world is absolutely erroneous. It matters what goes on in your house. And so if you if you are creating this, if if out of the womb, if out of the womb, babies are 74 percent likely to be or not likely, but born into single mother uh, homes. We they, they are born into a dis uh, 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 um, uh, a situation where they are born at a disadvantage. Now, I am a product of a single mother. Uh, I, I myself, you guys have heard my testimony sometimes even at nauseum. I, I, I am a product of a single mother. My mother had me when she was 16 years old. My mother is a part of this statistic. Uh, my mother uh, birthed me at the tender age of 16 years old, and my father was not in my house. Right. And so please hear this. Please hear this. Um, it took me years to come to this conclusion. It took years of God ministering me, uh, ministering to me by the power of the Holy Spirit for me to come to grips with some of the blanks that were in my life and, and some of the things that were missing in my life that had a direct impact on how I view life. My father not being there, my mother doing the absolute best that she could, and God bless her. I love my mother, love my mother. My mother worked two jobs, uh, making sure that I had what I needed to have in order to get it through life. 
So my mother did the absolute best that she could. But I'm not going to sit here and say that not having a father did not have consequences in my upbringing as a young man coming up in this world. Uh, because it did. And I do believe, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, that as I examine my own life, there are decisions, there are things in which I personally did in my upbringing, in my teenage years, in my t uh, early 20 years, that if I could have had the rearing of a man, uh, a productive man in my life to steer me from some of those pitfalls that I fell into, I would not have fallen into. Or I can say this, I would have had the choice to do something different had I had somebody in my life. So I know personally, not just from the statistics and the studies that I've done, that not having a father in the home or coming from a splintered home does have an impact in the lives of children. So now you go from 2018, you go from 24% all the way up to almost 74% of out of wetlock births in the African American community. You go from 6% in the white community in 1965, now up to 18.6%, I think, is the most recent numbers uh, in the white community. So now the numbers in the white community have also tripled. But their triple numbers in 2018 of 18% still dwarfs the numbers that we had in 1965 of 24%. And a lot of those numbers in the, in the white community have to do with this whole opioid crisis that has now been ravaging the Midwest and the upper north regions of our, of, of our states over the last uh, decade or so. And so a lot of those numbers are attributed to that. But even when you see 6% to 18% in the white community, you still see an upswing of people being born into out of wedlock or single parent homes. Now, of all of those numbers, uh, and we take the most recent numbers in 2018 was 74% of out of wedlock um, births in the African American community. Out of that 74%, the people that live with their fathers and fathers alone is only 7%. So now you have one or two different dynamics. You have a son or a daughter being born into a home uh, that only has a mother, may have access to the father, but the father out of that 74 percent are not engaged at a very, very high level. There are statistics that I will tell you that even out of the out of wetlock homes, there are fathers that are engaged uh, in their children's lives. But out of this, only 6% of that 74% of that son or that daughter actually stay with their father. So either one or two dynamics is happening. The son or the daughter is uh, staying with the mother and doesn't have the kind of access that they need to have with their father, or 6% of that 74% are staying with their father and don't have access to their mother. So either way that you shape it, either way that you look at it, you have a very, very detrimental cause um, to uh, the children growing up in that society. Take this all the way back to when we were talking about the slaves uh, born on plantations, even um, as, as, as hard as that particular time was. Um, the plantation owners understood the value of ripping families apart. And so when mothers would give birth to these particular sons on the plantations, they would allow those mothers to have access to those kids maybe for the first couple of years. And then they would rip those kids from the parents' home and take those little boys and little girls and ship them to neighboring plantations for uh, profits. And so they would be, then begin to raise those children on those particular plantations. But they understood the value of ripping families apart because a, a, a torn or a splintered family is going to have great consequence on the heirs of that family. And it's not only true in the 1800s, early 1800s, all the way up until uh, slavery was outlawed in 1863, but it's even all the way up until uh, our days today. Th there is a great consequence when families are splintered. Now, I, I, I am a family man through and through. Uh, I believe in the concept and the, and, and the precepts of family. And I believe that it is a very, very important issue to have when we're talking about family dynamics. Being raised in a married couple household led the poverty rate for black children for black children in a, uh, that are raised in a married household um, went down almost 73 percent. So 
families, a married household, husband and a wife, mother and a father, that are operating in a married household, the chances of those kids having a life of poverty goes down by 73%. Think about that number. The chances of those people having a higher education than do their parents go up by 59%. So think about this. Children that are born into a stable household where they have access to their mother and their father. Economically, they are more given a chance to succeed. Educationally, they're given a more chance to succeed simply because they are born into a stable household. The home does matter. The home does matter. The home absolutely does matter. When you're looking at the high rates of single parenthood in our time right now, uh, I believe it is at epidemic proportions where now we have to create social programming in order to meet this particular need. And it is a need. We got big brothers and big sisters. Um, this is a program that I have been involved with for a number of years to where you have people who will go and volunteer and be the big brother or big sister or, in essence, be the mentor of somebody that does not have a father figure in their life. Um, I participate with young boys, young black boys and young uh, young black men of distinction, um, which is a mentoring program that we have been involved with since 2012 um, to where we mentor uh, young black men who do not have a father figure who, or who come out of those particular areas of life to where they are much more subject to being caught in the vices of the ju um, judicial system. And so people uh, like myself and others um, often come alongside of these young men to give them um, a much more um, positive view of what a black man looks like. Um, right now, we have Manifest Mondays to where we are going through a 24-week class with nothing but uh, men in a biblical format to teach us about our God-given design, uh, what it means to be a, a, a Christian man, what it means to be a husband, what it means to be a father, what it means to be a friend. We're going through these things right now. Uh, we have pathways to success to where we go into these schools in HISD, into uh, Louisiana state schools that are typically uh, high, highly uh, concentrated with African Americans and minorities so that they're able to see people that look like them that have succeeded in areas of life. So there are programs and there are um, social programs that are created and that are tailored to meet this particular need because there is a need. There is a need. There is a need for us to um, um, intersect with a lot of these things that are going on in the world. But what does that mean for you and me? I, 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 again, going back to policy, policy works, but policy is not where it ends. It, it's not where it ends because you cannot fix the heart with policy. Um, I believe that a man is supposed to be intricately involved in the affairs of his home, that a man is to be a man. A man is to assume his God-given role as priest, provider, and protector. Now, if I take that outside of the realm of a biblical standard, a man is supposed to take care of his responsibilities when his responsibilities present themselves. And when we, as men, escape that responsibility, then we have a domino effect that will reverberate, not just in our lifetime, but in the lifetime of our seeds. And even in the lifetime of their seeds, it will, it will be like that wave that crashes against the shore. That wave starts not when you see it at the shoreline. That wave started way, way back when. And it makes its way into the shoreline. And then you see the effect of that wave on the shorelines of the beaches. However, if we're not, if we are escaping, if we are abdicating our responsibilities as men to the homes that God has given us, then we will see the effects of that in our children, in our children and in their lives. 
Now, please hear me. It's not that kids are not going to make stupid decisions and stupid mistakes, even though they come from two parent households. Of course, that's going to be the case, everybody. Nobody's arguing that even if you got a two parent household with a man that loves his wife and a wife that loves her man, that that's going to insulate or incubate our children uh, from not experiencing the, 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 the stupidity that comes along with life. Uh, of course, that's not the case. However, what we can do is greatly decrease the odds of those kids being affected by life in a very negative way. So as I look at the landscape right now in Jesus' name, uh, I see a lot of stuff going on. I see a lot of fingers being pointed. I see the blame game being played. Um, uh, even from Genesis chapter number three, you remember when they ate of the forbidden tree and their eyes were open, God was walking through the garden and he said, Adam, where are you? Uh, not in regards to geographical location. Of course he knew where he was, but Adam, you were supposed to be walking with me because me and you fellowshiped every single day. And now because sin has entered into the world, now there is this chasm that exists between a sinful man and a holy God. And God says, Adam, where were you? Where are you? And Adam said, I hid myself. And he said, I hid myself because I was naked. God says, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the forbidden tree? And he said, yes. And he said, but here's what Adam said. It's the woman that gave me the fruit. It's the woman's fault. And then the woman said, well, it's the serpent's fault. And here it is in the beginning of time, you have the blame game being played. You got the man blaming the woman for his issues. You got the woman blaming the serpent for her issues. And neither one of them wanted to look at themselves in the mirror and say, I am responsible for my own life. I'm responsible for that. I'm responsible for where I am in life. And man, do I believe that this is one of the core issues that we have right now? It is. Everybody's playing the blame game because victimhood is very, very sexy in our day. It's very, very easy to blame others for where we are in our own particular life. And no matter where you are, good, bad, or indifferent, the person most responsible for that place in your life is the person looking at you in the mirror. And so when we're looking at where we are right now, there are things in which we can directly address to help fix some of these issues that are plaguing our world. And again, everybody, from a biblical worldview, a biblical worldview and, and, and all of these stats right here that I have before me and all of these scriptures that I have before me, which I'm not going to be able to get to. Um, but it's easily accessible when you look at all of the things that are happening because of the splintered family. In this case, in the African-American community, that if we fix some things in our own community, these problems will begin to right themselves. And we can do this, everybody. We can do this as opposed to looking to the state house, the White House and City Hall to come in and rescue us, to come in and rescue us because we need this help. We, we're so poor and so disenfranchised that we can't do anything for ourselves. Um, because the man has the, his hand on our neck. We can't go to college. We can't get degrees. We can't obtain economic freedom. We can't own houses. We can't get businesses. We can't produce God-fearing children. We can't produce to this society. We can't contribute to this society. We can't walk down the street without getting shot by the cops. We can't. Everything is against us. Everything is against us. Everything is against us. Well, I, I strongly push back at that idea. While I am not naive to any stretch of the imagination by believing that we can't roll down the street singing Kumbaya, I do believe just by looking at what we are looking at now, facts, not opinions and, and not the emotions that typically come along with this argument, but where we are right now in race relations, as it looks like in 2021, um, is the best that it's ever been. Um, I don't know if you guys just recently heard that um, that we just now elected, uh, just now confirmed the first female Treasury Secretary in the 232-year history of the Treasury. It's never had a woman as its secretary. We just now elected that. She just got passed uh, through the Senate last week. 
all of these monumental steps are being taken all over the place. If you look at uh, the Biden administration right now, his entire uh, press corps, his entire press corps is female. Uh, his press director is female. Everybody in his entire press briefing um, um, uh, uh, office of his administration is female. Uh, these are unheard of times to where we are doing things right now. When you look at the presidential elections of 2020, you had uh, three women that were running for president um, in 2020. We are at the most culturally diverse time in our history, in our history. The Atlanta Police Department the Atlanta Police Department is 65% black. The Atlanta Police Department. Uh, here we are in uh, Houston, Texas, which is where I reside. Chief uh, Arcevedo is of Hispanic descent, and he's of the chief of, uh, chief of police here in Houston, Texas. The, the diversity across um, state lines and across the landscape of America has never been as good as it is right now. Americans right now, African-Americans financially are prospering more than they ever have throughout its entire history. Uh, African-Americans right now have a $2.4 trillion spending power. African-Americans. Spend two point four trillion dollars. We have two point four trillion dollars in spending power. We do as African-Americans. We have that particular spending power. We are more educated than we ever have in our entire history. We have more African. Now, here's a, uh, depending on where you look at it. More African-American females are graduating college than are African-American males. Um, but more African-Americans in general are graduating college with four-year degrees than we ever have, even one step above that. We have more African-Americans that are attaining PhDs and masters than they ever have in its entire history. And what I told you, which, which is one of the most uh, greatest things, Martin Luther King went to Morehouse College, started Morehouse College at the tender age of 15 in 1944. By 1955, he had attained his PhD at 25 years old. This is Dr. Martin Luther King in the 40s, went to Morehouse at 15 years old, and then he graduated from Boston College in 1955. Boston College up in the north, he was the uh, class president of a predominantly white class in 1955 where he attained his PhD. He was offered a job by IBM making six figures in his day, which he turned down in order to lead the civil rights movement that we so appreciate even to 2021. But now in 2021, notwithstanding the years leading up to that, African-Americans are doing better financially, not just better, but much better, exponentially better financially, exponentially better doing educationally, exponentially in business, um, entrepreneurship, uh, exponentially better in home ownership. Um, the things that are going on right now, if you look across party lines, if you look across racial lines, if you look across all of the things that people say, are separating us, all of those numbers are up. All of those numbers are up. And so what is going on here? I don't believe that it's policy, everybody. Uh, I, I believe that there is a, 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 a group of people that are standing up and making the difference at grassroots levels that are initiating this change that you have people out there that are determined to live a better life, to make a better life, to, to, to institute a better life of living, not only for them, but for their seeds and their seed seeds. Um, it is a, a, a driving force of mine that believes that it is the job of every generation to make it better for the generation that follows them. It is my job as a parent, as a father, as a husband to ensure that my children and those around me in my circle have a much better life than what I was able to enjoy. My kids are supposed to go further in life than I did. That is the job of every generation. And as you look at our generations, that has been the case. 
Each generation has surpassed the previous generation. In economics, in advancement, in education, wherever it may be, when you look at our generation, the African-American race, every generation has surpassed the previous generation. That trend has continued, that trend, that trend has started, and it is continuing even right now in 2021. We are making great headway, great headway. And so the idea that we are as racist, as homophobic, as xenophobic, as all of these phobias that everybody says that we are, that are putting up all these lines between people, you're red, you're blue, you're rich, you're poor, you're black, you're white, you're uneducated, you are uneducated, you live in South Park, I live in River Oaks, all of these divisions that people are putting up and that they say exist, the data just does not support that. But hear what I'm telling you, everybody. Divide and conquer is, an, is a tactic of the enemy. And I, I, I know that sounds crazy. I talked about it all last week. To get you to believe that you are better than somebody because of your skin tone is from the pit of hell. To get you to believe that you're better than somebody because you got more zeros in your bank is from the pit of hell. To believe that you're better than somebody because you live on one side of the town as opposed to the other is from the pit of hell. You're no better than anybody else. If I, if I cut you, you're going to bleed the exact same red as anybody else will. And so this idea that we are so racially divided, culturally divided, and that there are all of these walls that are being put up, the numbers, the facts, the, the facts don't bear that out. They don't bear that out. Uh, everybody, uh, African-Americans make up roughly about 14 percent of the populace at whole of the United States of America, about 14%. The Anglo community makes up about 69 to 70%. Within the next 10 years, excuse me, the next 15 to 20 years, the Hispanic population will almost double that of the African American race. They, right now, they're trending at about 13%. They'll be almost at 26% by the year 2040. So by the year 2040, the number of African-Americans at 14 percent will rise to about 16 uh, percent. Hispanics will rise to about 26 percent um, of the population here in America. So he here you have um, a particular race of people, a particular group of people that is trending upwards. But the African-American race is trending upwards, but at a very snail's pace. Now, I'm not going to get it all into this because I know it's a hot button issue um, uh, I'm not going to get into it. I'm going to dedicate an entire podcast with a guest at the beginning of April on this very issue about abortion in the African-American community. We're going to talk about it for the entire time. Um, and so I don't want to give a spoiler for it, but it's going to be a very, very, very good podcast. And we're going to talk about the devastating effects of abortion in the African-American community and the disproportionate rate of black Americans than do other minorities or other races in uh, this whole um, abortion debate that is raging uh, in our particular land right now. So here's um, as 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 as. One of the, the things in which I believe, and, and I hope, not I believe, I hope, I, I hope that we are having conversations that move the needle. What we have experienced in our land, and I'm not, I'm not relegating this to the last year, the last two years, last four years. I'm taking this back, as I said last week, all the way back to 2005 for the last 15 years uh, in America. Um, we've seen some things transpiring um, that have been getting to a point of no return. And, and I believe that cooler heads have to prevail. Um, I'm telling you, everybody, if you think that God is pro-white, you are lying to yourself. If you think that God is pro-black, you are lying to yourself. If, if you think that God is not just pro-person, uh, when you get to heaven, God is not going to say there's a section for black people, there's a section for white people, there's a section for Hispanic, there's a section for this, there's a section for that. It's not going to be in the channels of heaven. God is no respecter of person. The respecter of people is people. People make judgment calls. 
people bring into their circle other peoples as they do other not people. That's what people do because people are biased and people have their own angst. They have their own preferences and they make policies that, and they make rules and regulations that fit their biases and fit their own preferences. And then they march those things out and, 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 and mask it as though this is the landscape uh, of, of the land in which we live in. And it's not. It is not the landscape of, of the world in which we're living in. Uh, everybody, I, I hate to tell you this, um, but again, if you want to be political, you can be political. If you want to be politically correct, then you can be politically correct. Um, but the things that unite us are far greater than the things that separate us. And this is one of the things that Martin Luther King took to his grave. Um, he said that I will go to my last dying breath believing that all men are created equal in the eyes of God, our creator. He said, I'm going to take that to my grave. Uh, even though there are people that are hurling insults at me, even though um, he was assaulted four times, even though his house was bombed, even though he had a thousand threats against his family through the time that he was leading the civil rights movement. And of course, most of those came um, from the hands of people that did not look like him. Although some came from people that looked like him, most of them did not. He said, I'm going to take to my grave that all men are created equal in the eyes of God, our creator. Now, even he said that most people do not believe my message. And now all you got to do is just go back through Martin Luther King's life and you can see all of the risks that happened with some of the social leaders around his day and some of the risks that were between uh, him and other leaders that were propagating uh, the same message, but by different terms and techniques, how they got into uh, particular issues of not having the same ideology. Uh, so, you know, a quick uh, uh, study through history will tell you that. But, but he believed that all men were created equal. But he said that the cure to racism and prejudice and prejudice and all the other isms of our day was a fixing of the heart. Now, what does that look like in regards to Washington, D.C.? What does that look like in regards to the state house? What does that look like in regards to city hall? What does that look like in regards to your particular town, your particular area? Uh, I don't know because God is quickly being pushed out of many and all arenas. Um, but I do believe that if we're going to change this world, if we're going to change this world for the better, for the better, it cannot start with policy. It's got to start in the home. It's got to start in the home. It's got to start in the home. Uh, it's got to start with what you do, what I do in the hallways of our houses. It's got to start around the dinner table. It's got to start in personal conversations where we are able to go back to the days in which we put God at the center of our lives. God is the only thing that's going to fix this thing, y'all. Um, I believe that America is, um, and I can say this, everybody, not because I'm isolated to America, but America has afforded me some wonderful opportunities. Um, I have two kids that are in college right now and a son that is getting ready to go off to college. Um, and I believe that the future for these three um, is terribly bright. Um, we put some things in place that I am praying and putting my children in the hands of God that um, speak life and blessings over my children every single day. I know that I cannot always shield them from the problems and the issues of life, but uh, I do believe that their future is bright. Um, I do believe that their future is very bright. I do believe that those who are chasing their dreams and doing what they have to do in order to accomplish those dreams uh, will be the movers and the shakers of this world. And so all of these old fogies that are, you know, stuck in their own ways and, you know, have a certain ideology that will not change no matter what is presented to them. Uh, I believe just like God had to get rid of some of the children of Israel before he took them into the promised land, God's going to have to let some people expire on this side uh, to allow this new generation to usher us into the promised land where we won't be so hell bent on dividing people on issues that really don't matter. And so everybody, I want to leave you with this. God is good. Um, focus on your own home, focus on your family, focus on those four walls in your home. And what that will do is reverberate 
when your children leave the house, when you leave the house, when your wife leaves your house, when the husband leaves the house, because of what you're doing in the house, you can affect everybody outside of your house. And that's where it starts. It starts right there. And I pray in Jesus' name that we would learn the lessons of the past and go back and look at our forefathers, those great people that came before us, and pull some of those lessons even into our lives today because those folks were wise beyond their years. And so, everybody, I want to be a voice of uh, unity, not uniformity, unity. Um, I, I want to allow God to, and everybody, we're never going to shy away from those issues um, anybody that wants to have a conversation and wants to come right here on the set of Studio B, I want to make sure that you go ahead and email me at pastormdh at studiob.com. Uh, pastormdh at studiob.com. If you want to come on to the set, if you have some issues and you feel like you can bring some value to the set of Studio B, uh, make sure that you send me an email and let me know what you want to talk about. And then we'll put that thing together. We have an open forum here and we're going to talk about issues that need to be talked about. And we're not going to shy away from them because I believe that God is on my side. I believe that God is on the side of scripture and not on the side of society. And so we're going to uh, put that out there for anybody that wants to come on the set of Studio B. Uh, but everybody, no matter where you're watching us from, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, IG, uh, make sure you like, follow, subscribe. Whatever platform that you access your uh, podcast through, Studio B can be found right there. Thank you again, everybody, for your followership. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for being a partner to Studio B. It is greatly, greatly appreciated. We love you, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>